talk about the community around that project. Um, and also in our first section, we're going to have Karima Tooney, who is um, co-founder and art director of Media Molecule. Um, I think Media Molecule is a studio to which, you know, the whole industry owes a great aesthetic debt. Um, their recent release, Dreams, aims to put world-class content generation tools in the hands of a vibrant creative community. And Kareem's going to speak about how um, community and world building around this, uh, how that kind of, how they've designed for community and world building around this incredibly ambitious um, toolkit. Um, and so our second half, we'll have speakers Pete Billington, Leturbo Avedon, and Daniel Brathwaite-Shirley, and that will focus on representations of the self in virtual space, um, identity and memory, uh, creation of digital characters, and I'll, I'll go into that in a bit more depth after the break, but since we're on a tight schedule, um, I'm going to go right to our part one speakers and uh, introduce Paolo. Hi. Should I just go? All right. So yeah, my name is Paolo. I teach at Carnegie Mellon University School of Art. Uh, I mostly make video games and most of my work is released under the project name Mon Industria, which means soft industry or soft factory. And you know how artists love to say my work is at the intersection of this and that. And Mon Industria is at, at the intersection of ideology and electronic entertainment. Uh, so since 2003 i made about like 40 45 games and projects and i'm not going to talk about today but they all fall somewhere between digital art and uh, indie games and they often sit uncomfortably in both art contexts and commercial game contexts and that's uh, one of the reasons why i started like like because I, I i found that there were many products like that that were that are like not quite art and not quite games uh, uh, in the more like uh, traditional sense. So here in Pittsburgh, I ran, I ran this venue called Like Like with, with my partner and a, f and a few friends, uh, which is basically my garage. And uh, um, I, I kind of like have to talk about it, uh, what it was physically or what it is physically before I, I talk about the digital version. So uh, very quickly, like uh, it's a space for independent games and playable art. Physically speaking, in this, it's a small room of about 20 by 20 feet or seven by seven meters. Uh, conceptually, somewhere between an arcade and an artist-run gallery. There are um, only a couple of venues like this in the world, most notably Baby Castles in New York, uh, Video Game Art Gallery in Chicago. Uh, it's a strictly non-commercial endeavor. Uh, it doesn't have opening hours, so only one-night shows uh, that last about four hours, so it's more like event-based. Uh, and it's every first Friday of the month. Uh, so we opened this in February 2018, and we've been putting together um, 25 shows so far. They are all showcasing six games, so all centered around a theme. Uh, this one was about public transportation. Uh, this was a show about uh, Iranian games uh, made by Iranian and Iranian dias diaspora people. Uh, this was about a uh, known dystopian future. So sometimes use, they, they use like some uh, uh, custom setup. Uh, this was the first solo show uh, of a local digital artist uh, called Lauren Schmidt. Uh, this was, uh, we also had a Natalie Lawhead's uh, retrospective, uh, which she attended in telepresence. Uh, so it's mostly underground experimental stuff from solo developers or smaller teams. So, uh, this one uh, uh, was devoted to analog controllers. So actually, this maybe this video gives you uh, a better sense of the vibe in the space. Uh, I don't know if like uh, like uh, pixelated video going through all these uh, layers of streaming. I don't know how how good it will look, but yeah, it was basically about uh, analog controllers. Uh, um, we had like a game uh, uh, running on an oscilloscope, a game running uh, uh, an oscilloscope and an analog synthesizer for the sound effects. Um, uh, Line Wobbler, which is a kind of like a classic uh, in um, museums. It's a one-dimensional um, dungeon crawler. Uh, there, there was a collaboration between uh, me and Heather Kelly, uh, which is uh, this uh, game that is smell-based, uh, smell-activated. Um, so uh, and there was like an embroidery game, uh, VHS game, and things things like that. Um, so we mostly show video games, but every event there is at least one piece that is a bit special, something that is not digital or not on the internet, like this short uh, uh, LARP by Akira Thompson uh, that was in response to the killing of Trevor Martin. Uh, so you have kind of like you have like this single player LARPing experience, actually two player, uh, or some games that are made for the show, like this is a full operation game uh, about the kind of like outlandish, outlandish diseases diagnosed to women in the Victorian era and it was made for, for the show, uh, or like 
city build city building board game that uses my actual dog as a board and the dog is a kind of like random event generator or catastrophe or site specific installation this is an augmented ping pong table uh, uh, by a local musician um anyway so uh, one thing that also we do consistently uh uh, uh, is like a non audiovisual com com complement that is usually involving taste or smell, but we try haptics too. Uh, and they are all curated. We have like a curator, we are just like three people really, but we have a, one of them is a, a sensory director, sensory curator that um, uh, figures out what like step, taste and smell goes well with the particular show. Um, yeah, for example, like a show about optical illusions, we offer my miracle berries that transform uh, food, food flavoring and uh, things like that. Um, so as you can see, uh, like, like it's this window less cram space with people touching controller, sharing food and drinks. Uh, so it's kind of like the perfect environment for the spread of COVID-19. So we always obviously had to suspend all events, uh, very early on. Um, but being game people, we are quite comfortable with online stuff. So we took it as a kind of like a challenge to experiment with formats and also to show things that we wouldn't normally show in the space. Uh, for example, uh, this was a show uh, we show for for rather obscure interactive movies uh, from the 60s to the 2000 uh, on Twitch, let, letting the audience vote for each choice. They are kind of like choose your own adventure movie, uh, like precursor of Bandersnatch, I guess. Um, uh, one experiment was a text only multi user environment, which was for an exhibition of text only games. So the games were text, uh, and uh, the, the exhibition space was uh, a multi user dungeon slash twine, uh, and uh, in which you can sort of like chat with other people that are, that are there and also like kind of like look for hidden uh, uh, games uh, that are integrated in the, envir in the environment. and. Uh, uh, in this uh, in this chat, you're sort of like there are viruses going around, uh, like there are language viruses that affect your way of speaking and make you sing and scream or, or add uh, some some kind of aff affectation. And by talking to other people, you are you have a chance to pass them around. And uh, uh, perhaps the most popular interaction iteration was a, a graphic virtual space uh, like like online. Uh, we were also like you know presented as the smallest uh, MMO RPG, um, and uh, with this, I kind of wanted to recreate the, a bit of this social situation around the games themselves, because obviously games are kind of like just an excuse to hang out together. Um, and uh, um, the um, and I also wanted to make something that matched, matched the first two exhibitions, the first two exhibition of the online sort of like iteration where uh, games made in uh, Parco 8 and Bitsy, which are two engines that use low resolution and kind of like very tight technical constraint as a cre creative constraint. And they all have like a, a vibrant community, and uh, so and, and more importantly, they build games that are playable from the browser. So with one click, you can get to the game. You don't have to download anything. So in addition of having a theme, uh, these two shows were also celebrations of two communities of video game zinsters, essentially. And since the code of Like Like Online was open sourced and designed to be easy to modify. A bunch of festivals and exhibitions uh, made their own uh, mods for their online events. Uh, mostly, I would say, like uh, student exhibitions, but there was like a full uh, mod, uh, like a full conversion uh, use, like that made it look like a uh, hyper cards, or like there was like the one on the top left was like an Argentina women in game inc incubator. Uh, on the bottom right, the free play festival in Melbourne, uh, they adapted it to even like have a talk, so, you know, li live stream talk, so you could just watch a thing and uh, and have like conversations. So, and um, yeah, Bion Collective, uh, I think in Scotland, they added all sorts of features. So, so it was uh, pretty, pretty interesting how like it kept living beside, uh, you know, this essentially two events. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, the, the uh, the I would say like it it was quite successful. So two two weeks after the opening, uh, uh, the, the the museum gentrified and opened a new wing, like the, the and uh, it's called like the online museum of Mo multiplayer art, uh, which was uh, it's just made uh, of nine playful environments that are. Uh, um, quoting the press release, uh, they interrogate the notion of mediated society and digital embodiment. And uh, the OMOMA was this kind of like tongue-in-cheek response to the forced vir virtualization of the art world uh, under COVID-19. And uh, it was also like a bit of a virtual museum in itself. Uh, 
so actually, like, I don't know how much time do we have. Is, is anybody keeping a check on me? Uh, yeah, I'm keeping an eye on it. They'll give me a notice when you're running out of time. Um, okay. there's, there's some time scheduled for you and me to chat a bit, but it, I, it would be much better if you just used it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so like if you like, you should see uh, that uh, that link there, which is uh, I guess like like dot glitch dot me, uh, and uh, um, I can give you a quick tour until the time is over if it's uh, if it's online currently. So that's an issue. Yeah, obviously, it might not be. Um, but yeah, that's uh, uh, oh, there is also a 3D version that I didn't uh, mention. I should probably. Let me see if okay. We have about so, five minutes, I think, Paolo, for this. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, like, you can uh, the the 3D version actually it looks like uh, this. One second, I gotta I gotta pull it out. Um, looks a little bit like this. Yeah. And uh, it's also like that's uh, the the most recent iteration. Uh, you're sort of like actually creating your avatar and uh, every avatar. Um, you can create that, any sort of avatar as long as it's some kind of salamander. Uh, and uh, you're, yeah, you sort of like kind of like walk around. This is actually the most like uh, literally, um, like the most literal adaptation of the space. It's just like, it really kind of feels like a being in that, in that space. Uh, you can also lick frogs and, and such. Uh, but yeah, if you are interested, in the, the the link uh, um, the link is that one. Like like three D dot Heroku dot app. Uh, maybe somebody can post it in the in the YouTube, and we can try to to hang out in that space and see if it crashes. Uh, but yeah, uh, you should be taken to a uh, character creation, uh, and then uh, you are uh, hanging out. So th this this was for a show that was uh, all focused on uh, uh, first person uh, games. Um, so they are, uh, um, yeah, they are kind of like experimental, also browser-based uh, um, first-person games. So if you probably, if you log log in, you should probably appear in the space uh, that you are seeing. Um, yeah. So what was the one that I played that was two-dimensional? Because I thought that was really cool. Yeah, so the one that is two-dimensional, one second, I'm going to pull it out, uh, pull it off. It's called... Cool. Uh, uh, yeah, that's uh, that was the first uh, two-dimensional iteration, and it was uh, uh, basically, um, yeah, basically a point-and-click thing. It's I want to wanna be... talk to you about the sitcom family room because I thought that was really interesting for this. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Since that might be maybe starting now, that's that's kind of interesting. That is offline, but um, it might take it might take a second to wake up. <laughs> Well, so what what have you sort of found? Um, so you you sort of imagine this space now in a few different incarnations, and in each sort of translation, um, how are you kind of interpreting? You know, you have a three D world where everyone's a salamander. You have a two D version. You have a, a, a physical world version. Um, what kind of design sensibility is uniting all three, and how do you sort of approach that that process of translation? Um... I would say uh, I would say maybe there are different concerns every time. Uh, oh yeah, there is somebody here. So for example, in this one, it is a bit glitchy, but uh, in this one, since it's first person, I wanted to I could spend like a little bit more uh, time and attention to uh, have something that you don't usually see in uh, in online games, which is kind of like eye contact. The fact that you can sort of like look at some, like look at what people are looking at. Um, so like, uh, yeah, there is like the, the eyes now, like the eyes are, uh, uh, are like glowing in this case, but, but the eyes can have pu pu pupils uh, and uh, you can, uh, eyeballs and uh, you, you can see except pretty, pretty much like have that sort of like, uh, eye contact, eye line, uh, um, they're very precise eye line gaze match. Um, so that, that was one. Uh, for example, and then I mean, you can also emote, and you can uh, sort of have like some like dances and stuff that are uh, turns out that we're like uh, kind of you know popular and expressive, and people wanted to do so. Uh, in uh, in other, um, it depends. Let me see if I can uh, if, if the uh, uh, two dimensional one is well. If not, I can show some pictures. Uh, so the two dimensional one kind of like looks uh, a little bit like uh, this. Uh, like this. 
Um, and uh, in that case, uh, the yeah, I would say like the idea was, uh, uh, I mean, like actually there, there, there's the iteration in which uh, it's just, a, it's a museum and uh, the museum, uh, the idea of that, how do I have any picture? No, okay, that's great, fantastic. Um, the idea was to have uh, something, some kind of like non-reliable chat and to some extent, uh, uh, one, uh, like the room that you're mentioning is a room in which you are sort of like hanging out in this space uh, and you're assigned a role. Uh, and the role is, uh, you know, just like, uh, the role is like uh, all like family members in a, in a house, in a suburban family, essentially. Well, it's actually so pretty interesting because you, you said everyone's a salamander in the 3D version. In the 2D version, you're sort of kind of, you know, non-specific avatars as well, just, you know, brightly colored. And when you enter this particular room, you randomly change into one of the family members that's part of this kind of Walton style, you know, sitcom family that's engaged in dialogue with each other and you can participate. I spent so long doing that Paolo why did I spend so long doing that it's uh yeah like it's weird because uh yeah like a lot of people like the, uh, so, some people don't get it and uh, the ones who get it uh, actually do <laughs> do really invest a lot into that people kept so, coming in and joining my story I loved it yeah so what one reason like the it started as a kind of like a joke uh, uh, one reason was that we presented the uh, online gallery as uh, uh the smallest uh, the tiniest uh, massively multiplayer um massively multiplayer game and uh, some uh, you know gamer guy was like well actually there is no role play involved and i was like oh sure i'll give you some role play then and uh, so yeah that's uh, that's the kind of like the genesis um yeah i can i can uh, pull out some some images here since it's not starting for some reason but yeah yeah, there were there were a number of interesting um, interactions I had in that space. Um, in, in your presentation, you showed sort of the conversation engine um, that kind of reinterprets dialogue into other dialogue. And, and there's a couple of rooms in the space that, that use that to affect as well. It did kind of it. It kind of felt to me the way a modern art gallery should be in that the use of the space and the interactions that you have in there are part of the experience, which is obviously intentional on your part. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That, that, that was kind of like the, the, yeah, the, the approach to that. Like if you are approaching a, ga a gallery and galleries and museum spaces as uh, you know, a game designer, you're approaching them as the spaces and ex ex experiences, especially if you don't have, a, I would say like the weight of the institution. So like, I don't like, this is not like an institution that I have to uh, kind of like, um, how do you say, like, uh, make use of a fancy piece of real estate uh, in order to function, right? Like, uh, to me, it's totally fine if my garage is temporarily closed. Uh, but um, but one thing that was definitely missing in making an online exhibition that is, I didn't want to just make a website with a bunch of links, hey, check, check this out, was essentially the, everything that is around it. So, like, having, like, a, a movement in space and even, like, a... a tiny even the tiniest uh, embodiment even in this like uh, 16 by 16 pixels uh, characters actually changed uh, a lot of dynamics it was like weird because uh, there were like people that like at some points like the artists showed up you know for example like a uh, porpentine showed up and everybody was like whoa hi how are you like nice to see you and you know like you can do that on twitter you know like you can you can you can be in touch with all these people like normally but having like a a little representation of it was actually quite uh, quite different. It also had like a very like early internet vibe because uh, there's not much to do in there. And so people were like, oh, so where are you from? You know, I that really kind of like that. You know, I was surprised. Usually when you give people kind of like an open chat opportunity, they're going to abuse it. But everyone there was, op maybe it's a, it's a consequence of having a, a small community who, around a specific type of interaction, but everyone there was operating in good faith. Like even people who sort of had the motivation to be anarchic had ways that, you know, outlets within the world for that, you know, that it, it, it was supported by the overall feel of the place you know yeah yeah so some of the i'm, I'm kind of like a, creating a live show i guess on the on the spot here but yeah some of the uh, rooms that are that are there for it uh, we're uh, kind of like based uh, on uh, the uh um on some of the misuses that were happening in in the space uh for example oh i, I got a video actually um for example there there, there is a room that um for like kind of encourages you to say things that are censored. Yeah, uh, there is a, a room yeah. like this. 
We have about 30 seconds left. Do you have any parting words oh, okay. on, on, uh, on enabling behavior in, in purpose-built community spaces? Yeah, yes. Uh, I would say like uh, um, encouraging uh, some kind of subversive play is uh, um, it can be it can it can be interesting. Like basically, like if people <laughs> if people are bored and you don't give them a lot to do, they will essentially test the limits of the uh, they will test the limits of the engine of the space because that's the most interesting thing. Even if you have content, if you have you know. Uh, speakers in the space so that's the, I, I would say like the practical takeaway and most of the this omoma museum was a play on that okay you want to be subversive just be a, i'll give you some framework for that interesting so that actually makes kind of a good transition point to our next speaker what players do given an environment where they're you know provided tools and kind of encouraged to be expressive uh we now have um kareem atuni from media molecule um for me, Media Molecule as a studio with games like with Big Planet and Dreams, um, that's a new bar for the aesthetic qualities that we find on a console game platform. Um, Kareem is the art director and co-founder, and his diverse experience is in interior design, graphic design, um, uh, film, film sets, theater design. And I think um, the diversity of that kind of experience helps uh, clearly helps inform, inform the studio's um, you know, ambitious and community-driven creative projects, uh, which tend to combine games and creative software and sharing tools in these rare and unparalleled ways. Um, and I'm told Kareem has been instrumental in the striking painterly aesthetic of dreams, um, which he's now here to tell us more about. Uh, so welcome, Kareem. Thanks for joining us. Hello, hello. <laughs> hello there. I'm um, uh, very happy to be here. Oh, so uh, are you uh, are you ready to make your uh, presentation? Absolutely. Cool. I uh, I have a, a video here running of uh, myself creating in Dream, and here you can see our philosophy in the project was to try to make three D creation sensitive. And what I mean by sensitive, you can see a picture in picture coming up all the time, showing the hands and the motion captured uh, uh, every uh, movement. You can see me here just uh, uh, putting the cubes in 3D space using my one-to-one uh, -one controllers, uh, the move controllers uh, that were from captured by the, 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 the camera. And I can do one gesture to go from adding and cutting, another gesture to zoom out and in. The biggest philosophy in the UI design was live gear changing. Uh, what is unacceptable in uh, a lot of 3D tools is uh, atomic operations where you have to stop, go to the scale tool, then stop again and go to the move around tool and then stop again and then go to uh, resize my object tool. Here I've just tapped my two controllers together, for example, and I've stretched that same cube. So from one cube, we are going into making a little uh, a form uh, just by changing the shape, the size of it, uh, squashing it into a flat form uh, turning it upright and making walls from that form. The, the biggest idea in our UI was to not make it about the tool. It's all about what's in your head and uh, how fast can you go from one thing to the other. It, it takes a little bit of time to sort of get your head around it, but so does the guitar. You know, I, I think uh, the, the, if you want a tool that captures the idiosyncrasies and the human uh, uh, uniqueness, I don't think that uh, uh, an amazing result after working for 10 hours says anything. What's very important is the first mark. If you look at oil painting or one strum on a guitar, you can tell who is doing it. And uh, uh, it doesn't matter if I've done 5,000 choices and they're fantastic. At that point, it's not the tool anymore. It's the expertise. Here in Dream, we try to make the change of gear capture every nuance of the, the, the user. So for example, here you're seeing me do another gesture 
where I'm changing the color by activating a, a, a color picker. But that was unacceptable still. So we, what we did was another feature, which I select a, a bunch of colors, drop them into the circle at the bottom and spin it. And now my cube will change and cycle between that set of colors. That means that I don't have to stop and go to the palette every second to change the color. And if I'm doing a brick wall or a variation of uh, tiles on a floor, I just don't get interrupted and move my head uh, around. One of the reasons that oil paint is still with us after 500 years is that it's still unsurpassed in uh, what it can do. Here I went from stamping one cube at a time to smearing the cubes to create a more flowing mark. And as you can see in the, the what's manifesting around you, this is all from cubes, just one cube. And all our underlying tech is accessible to you via magic wand type gestures. Now I've done activated another gesture which uh, 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 soft blends my cube into the neighboring one. And that allows for a more organic type sculptural style. All that is still within the same model. I'm placing now spheres and by twisting my auxiliary hand, because our control scheme relies on two hands, because we've got two hands. Uh, so so you, you use your secondary hand to do shortcut operations. In this case, I've activated soft blending, uh, negative and positive soft blending, allowing me to do these kind of organic shapes, which are fantastic for muscles and uh, uh, designs of aliens and uh, ergonomical motorbikes and spaceships and that sort of thing. And now I've just done another little shortcut to make hard blend, which is a more faceted way of blending the forms together. Uh, I We were so big in our UI design to make all these uh, operations available to you live because it doesn't matter to me that it is a little bit hidden. Uh, I prefer available than visible because uh, in a way that allows performance and performance was one of our key words for designing our UI. There's enough amazing tools out there when you see the movies and the special effects and the crazy superhero stuff, you know, there, the world is not waiting for more powerful 3D tools. But what we were waiting for was an expressive one that allows you to work in 3D like you work in oil painting. Here I, I for example, uh, changed my colors. I've made my marks more fuzzy. We call that the painterly or the loose engine. It took our engine programmers, our fabulous uh, Alex and Simon and uh, Mark Adami to do uh, 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 magic. And under the hood, there is so much going on, but we don't expose that in, in, in what we expose to the people are more human concepts. Like we call that the flex. So you either have a, a solid sphere or a fuzzy one. And the fuzzy, you choose which style of painting you uh, finish you want, and then you activate how strong you want the effect to be. And here I'm mixing that up with blending, which was the other feature we've seen earlier. So now it's fuzzy and blended. All these are compound technologies that I'm explaining to you, but for the player or the user, all they care about is shapes. I've got some shapes and I can make it blendy or I can make it fuzzy or I can make it green or I can make it shiny. Uh, but I can do all these things on the fly while I'm sculpting, never posing. Here I've changed my, my approach to using only the paint marks without underlying geometry. This is our most painterly end of the spectrum. Uh, and I've gone to a part of our tools, which is co called the paint tools. I pick the style I want and I start placing it in 3D. The same as you would place a pastel on a paper, but this is just in 
physical space. The nice thing is because the motion is captured by the 3D input. I, I tell you, the 3D input move controllers were the reason I personally worked on Dream, because I felt that that interests me personally to undertake making 3D tools that I haven't seen before, uh, that are capable of doing all the cool sort of science fiction-y mechs and things, but also can give you a virtual Monet or a Rodin-style sculpture that captures every shiver of your hand. I, 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 what I dislike about a lot of uh, CG out there is that I can't tell who's done it. But when I see a sculpture by Michelangelo or Rodin, you go, this is Degas, this is Michelangelo, this is... And uh, you don't talk about the tools, you talk about the people. So here I am uh, tinting the, 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 the world. So again, we, we, we created these features which allow you, after the fact, to tint. And the more I hold my hand over what I'm tinting, the more it applies the color. Again, all these things we've seen a million times before in, in different UI that relies on sliders and stuff like that, where you sort of select the amount and on a slider. But the act of spraying it directly on the object and either adding the tint or subtracting and sucking that tint a little bit back, moving things in space and placing it using your motor skills. And that was, by the way, before VR got hot, you know, like VR now is all uh, uh, on trend and a lot of UI is, are now adopting these measures. But we were thinking about this in 2011, where uh, uh, we knew that the future of uh, 3D creation has got to be uh, empowering the, the creative people or the people, creative makes people upset. I think uh, uh, empowering people who have something in mind to be able to get it on screen without needing uh, uh, to be very tech oriented. Like for example, here I just made a big blue cube then made it a bit more painterly using our painterly tools and then another tool to turn it into water that just animates or moves the paint across the cube. And now I've got C without particle systems and crazy uh, 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 concepts that uh, talk about bursts and flow rate and whatever. Like these concepts uh, uh, are not the C. You know, uh, when, when you're thinking, I need water here, uh, you're not thinking about birth rate and flow rate and uh, uh, emitting per minute and things like that. Uh, here I put uh, the sun in the world, and now I'm moving it in relativity to that uh, sphere. And by doing that, uh, I have... Uh, so here you can see some conventional UI where I've activated uh, what we call the tweaks. And the tweaks are deeper tools that allow you to use familiar UI where you kind of have more precision control. So Dream can go all the way from the expressive to the precise, uh, especially because it's a game design tool as well, not only an artistic tool. So game design requires uh, the game to be able to change conditions. And to change the conditions, you need numbers. And you need to go go from this value to this value and that. But a lot of our UI, as you can see, is drag and drop, place in the world, change the mood, change the color. Uh, I'm changing here the gobo, which is like, you know, the filter coming through the light. Uh, people who are familiar with 3D tools will see things that look familiar and will see things that don't. The, 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 the thing that I like personally about Dream the most is that we were set off from the beginning to make a tool that captures individual styles, that allows you to be able to say, I'm looking here at uh, Maya style or uh, John Eckersley style. These are two, by the way, of our artists, they're fantastic, and each one of Dan. Or, and I've got a video, by the way, after this one, which is a tiny two-minute video, uh, which will cycle between 
some of the art that the guys uh, and girls have done. Uh, I will uh, maybe move now from this one because I can keep going and, uh, forever. Uh, but you've seen, I think, enough of what I mean. Like here I'm rotating, for example, a shape. I made a cylinder. I squashed it with a gesture. I twisted it with my left hand. And then I paint in midair with a spinning uh, gesture. Some of these fun UI ideas came from uh, fabulous Anton and Liam and Dave and uh, Matt and some of our great clever programmers who, who really uh, uh, did some fabulous stuff. And this is only the visuals. If you see, we've got the equivalent in audio, animation, and all the other disciplines. And each one of them tries to do the same thing of uh, capturing the individual expression of people, but also being deep enough to make competitive CG that stands in the middle of 2020 games uh, proudly. Uh, now I I will uh, change if you can uh, help me change. Yeah. This video here shows a cycle of some of the art that has been created from people's hands. This is the first one was Maya. This one is John. John is very arty and expressive. He likes uh, his sort of uh, 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 bacon's and. Uh, abstract expression is uh, uh, this is another uh, model by him as well and you can see the style of the artist every little mark coming from their hands uh, and every uh, 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 different uh, uh, this is Francis one of our beautiful artists and uh, Dan here like what I like about them is that I remember the artists when I see the artwork. I don't think about dreams. I think about Emily. I think about Francis. I think about, and this is the same when we hear a Eric Clapton song or when we see a, 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 a drawing by Degas. We don't say uh, this brush or this uh, type of paint. Uh, the, the, again, and by the way, a lot of this work that you're seeing in front of you was done in a day you know, not uh, six months or, you know, and again, a sort of another one from my uh, uh, a still life done by a Menlu, a painterly one. And you can see how all the painterly, the tight, and this is one of mine, because uh, I like, you know, the Rodin and stuff. So there you go. That was a quick overview of how we went about in making our tools and some of the individual styles that get celebrated and showcased by using Dream. Well, thank you so much. It is now time for us to have a Q&A with both of our speakers, Kareem and Paolo. Um, it was really interesting. I thought you you both, in a sense, are, are giving presentations about you know creativity within space, but you're approaching it from, from very different angles. Um, I wonder, what do you think, do you think, are you acquainted enough with one another's work to opine on what you what you see in common in, in one another's practices? Or is that way too deep a question for life? It's, I think it's a deep question, but I'll let you start and then I will cheat. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot. I should have maybe like warned you on that one. But think about it. I'll come back to it. Um, we did have a, a question from the audience. Um, one of our viewers said um, that it was interesting, um, Kareem's point about oil paint. Um, were there other real world tools that inspired the craft set in Dreams? Yeah, big time. I, I like to... The, my favorite tool of all time in sensitivity is the piano. Uh, the piano was uh, 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 evolved from the harpsichord, and they, the word piano was meant quiet. Uh, so the heavier the commission was basically to make those hammers that uh, allow the the Christ, uh, Christophilus, I think, is uh, to when you press each key, it, it's louder or, or quieter. And the span of the piano is the size of the human arm range. Uh, I think in terms of designing something that is relative to the human being and the human dimension that captures every expression and allows you to get range from Chopin to Muse 
or to Elton John. Like, uh, basically, I haven't seen a tool out there that stands the test of time. I like timeless tools. I don't really um, uh, find things that are hot for one year and then everybody forgets about it the next year uh, of any interest. I, I, uh, so definitely the piano, guitar, and pencils i love pencils i do crazy cool a pencil uh, how if, look at our signatures and and that so definitely i took a lot of inspiration from timeless tools like that but in terms of the digital some of the 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 metaphors as well that have been used in some of our other areas are things like you know uh, 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 synchronizers and uh, sequencers and things that are more digital. But for me, I would say the pencil and the piano. I came up with an answer to my own question about both of you. Cool, I, let's shoot. <laughs> I think you both make complex artistic concepts accessible to people through design. Um, uh, and in, even though you make different kinds of spaces for that. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I, I really, Kareem, I really liked your point also about wanting to see the expression of the user in the tools. So I'm an amateur artist type as well. Um, you know, I love I love the way that games have made things that I'm almost good enough at kind of uh, within reach to me. I have some artistic inclination, but not enough to learn proper software. Um, and, and so I think with things like this, um, when we're talking about, you know, how to make complex things accessible or how to invite people um, to be surprised by concepts that maybe, you know, you know, Apollo, I think your work surprises people with concepts that they maybe wouldn't have approached directly. Um, what is, how do you start with the design consideration? Um, you know, wh what do you start with in creating a space that achieves that um, goal of inviting a user into an access uh, into a complex idea simply? Um, Paolo. Oh. If you want to go first. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, this is a, a question that I started asking myself, obviously, before I kind of like uh, moved online. And uh, uh, it has to do to, to deal with like the kind of baggage that comes with the exhibition space, the gallery, yeah. the white wall, the, you know, the white cube, the museum. And uh, uh, how do you uh, create a, an environment that is like uh, invites that kind of play? Because, so, you know, like if you enter a museum, you're not really supposed to touch the art. You're not really supposed to interact with things. Uh, and uh, there are like a variety of strategies. Uh, uh, one, what simple one, this is like just like designing it like with l colored lights. So it is a white wall. It, it is a white cube. So it has that kind of flexibility. But uh, like even just like uh, changing the lighting uh, uh, makes it look uh, and feel a little bit more like a nightclub. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it was a counterculturist, counterculturalist space, right? <laughs> on, uh, uh, on on creative tools, I think accessibility, uh, I might add, is a very deep uh, concept because uh, there is a lot of uh, misconception or confusion between accessibility and easiness. Uh, which are very different things. Mm -hmm. Now, now a lot of digital tools do a mess, magnificent job in seducing people's time. When you see uh, what uh, uh, Little Big Planet or Minecraft or these kinds of things uh, are, are very, very seductive. Uh, uh, Sims game lets people do their own houses and stuff. Uh, but uh, there is uh, uh, also certain uh, uh, so i would say that you need to do breakthroughs on a lot of avenues you need to do breakthroughs on the user interface and the the user experience which i showed a little glimpse of in the tool but also you need to revolutionize how you educate uh, education is the key word if you talk to people like and you tell them like what, what made you play the guitar, you know? And uh, some someone would just like, go, I, I taught myself listening to the radio and someone would see, uh, now there's lots of cool things in YouTube that show me how to do this and that. Uh, I think technology can play an amazing part in uh, mixing metaphors of gaming and education that combine together to seduce people's time. In the end, you grow when you invest and you nurture. 
There is no way around that concept. If you nurture a tree, the tree will grow. If you don't nurture it, it won't. All we can do is make the act of nurturing more enjoyable. I love that, making the act of nurturing more enjoyable. And uh, we have one more question from our Twitch users, and then we have to uh, wrap for a break. So I would love if I could get each of you to try to maybe answer it with brevity. If you can, think of an example of um, a time when providing users with these, with these tools or this kind of space has led to an outcome that really surprised you. Um, that was from somebody on Twitch. Um, Paulo. Go. <laughs> no, no, you, you, you go first. Are you seeing tools <laughs> in ways you couldn't have imagined? Basically? I got, yeah, I got so many things to say about dreams, uh, but yeah, like I don't think it's my place to. <laughs> no, please do, please do. No, I, th please I think do. what's really amazing about uh, about dreams is not just that it's making it easier and more accessible. I think the accessibility is like uh, a bit fraught to me. Like the, uh, I, I don't know if we need uh, like more people being able to three D model, but what really excites me about dream and uh, and i think it can be really like a long term uh, change is the paradigm shift that is producing and will produce in uh, just uh, 3d modeling uh, software essentially like so far like we've been stuck in this paradigm that is uh, cad computer assisted design that is basically meant to produce the, to uh, design uh, metal objects mechanical parts and still like a lot of 3d mo modeling uses that kind of uh, definition and paradigm and that and that idea so uh like i'm really interested in how uh that uh sort of like user experience shifts shifts with time and yeah because i think at the end of the day we are hacking this uh, very like utilitarian tools into making turning them expressive right you're not starting with a guitar we are starting with like a chainsaw or something uh you're making rains uh, uh, and it's based on a database and the database is just used for accountability you know accountant and uh, and things like that and you're turning into an expressive tool so mixing I, and, and and the mixing of media i love the hybrid generation that now we have. We have people that have skills that we have no words for. And uh, today with uh, journalism being mixed with uh, expression and user publishing, uh, mixed with entertainment and CG and traditional media is creating new phenomena. What is interesting to me is to see that new forms of uh, 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 expression and social voice coming out and playing its part in the bigger picture, whether it's going to be uh, uh, a short story or a world-changing event. Well, thank you very, very much, both of you. I think that was really super interesting. We have to have a break now. And when we come back, we will have part two focused on characters with three new speakers. Look forward to seeing you then. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Welcome back to part two of Imagined Realities. I'm your host, Lee Alexander. And if you joined us earlier, you heard Paolo Petersini and Karim Etuni discussing um, different kinds of expressive spaces. Um, now, this portion of our program um, will focus on expression um, from a character-driven standpoint, um, also issues of self-representation in online space and virtual memory. Um, I remember 10 plus years ago, you know, being told we would eventually all have avatars and we'd all live second lives as 3D creatures in 3D worlds that would exist in parallel to our real world. Um, and that sort of, you know, metaverse promise, um, you know, ended up having a lot of shortcomings. Um, but nonetheless, I have these days ended up with a second idealized self, um, you know, the appealingly filtered version of me that um, appears on an Instagram story, you know, the one with the perfectly curated opinions, theoretically. Um, <clears throat> that brings me to um, artist Laturbo Avedon, um, who exists as an avatar. Um, Laturbo Avedon is one of the speakers in this upcoming section. And in the video they made accompanying um, Your Progress Will Be Saved, which reimagines the Manchester International Festival's factory in Fortnite Creative, um, I liked how Laturbo describes virtuality as a sort of mirror world um, where through their work, they kind of intentionally invert those relations um, between you know, the virtual self and the physical self or the virtual world and the physical world, um, where the physical world is the reflection, um, assuming that I'm interpreting them correctly. Um, so after Laturbo's presentation, we'll hear from artist Danielle Brathwaite Shirley. Um, Danielle uses technology to imagine environments that center black trans people um, oriented around recording and retelling their stories. Um, Danielle's work um, can be described as, quote, a trans archive where black trans people are stored for the future. Um, but first in this part of the program, we have Pete Billington, who is co-founder and director of Fable Studios. Um, and they are exploring next generation AI driven, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> next generation AI driven character technology, uh, which is an exciting place to start off, especially since I seem to be running out of air. Take it away, Pete. Oh, thank you so much for having me today. Um, yeah, today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our character Lucy and a project that we've been working on for a while called Wolves on the Walls. We'll be, uh, it's been out on Oculus Rift for about a year, but um, it will be out on the Quest this month, which is pretty exciting. Um, yeah, let's start talking about it. Um, so this all started with a project called Henry. Um, Henry's a little hedgehog that was one of the first uh, virtual reality sort of entertainment movie experiences. And there was just this moment in Henry where he makes eye contact with the audience. And it was kind of a throwaway idea. So like, oh, it'd be cool since we know where you are in 3D space and we know where the character is in 3D space, we can actually just track that and have this little moment of connection. Um, and we found that people were really taken back by a character that could actually see them. Um, and it inspired us to really sort of delve into that idea uh, much more deeply. Um, we also knew that these little touch controllers were gonna uh, come online. So I actually had one of the first pair ever created, this little prototype pair, and actually uh, an artist that was working on a painting program called Quill had the other one. So we had to share the left and right prototypes to figure out what it meant to have your hands uh, inside of a story. Because as soon as you could pick things up or interact um, with your hands, it meant that you played a role somehow in the story. And then that had knock on effects. Things that were obvious to us in, in games, but not necessarily cinema. So we had to start thinking about what the implications uh, would be when we were telling a story. Um, and so this is the character that we, uh, we invested all of this energy into. It's based on um, a short story by uh, Neil Gaiman um, called Wolves in the Walls. It's a children's story, it's a fable. Um, it's, it's largely about um, confronting fear and that things aren't as scary when you face them head on. And we felt like this was the perfect uh, theme to explore inside of virtual reality. Um, the thing that's interesting about Lucy is that she does engage the audience. She engages them directly. Um, she interacts emotionally based on the audience, um, and she does change her performance based on the choices that you make. Um, so all of these things had pretty significant implications, both in narrative storytelling, in staging, in camera, and lighting, all of the things that you would traditionally do in a film, um, they became much, much more complex when we were in a spatial environment, when we were sharing a space with the character. Um, and we cast you, the audience, as Lucy's imaginary friend. Um, 
And so our real goal is to make you feel like what it felt like when you were eight years old. And we do that in a lot of different ways. Um, but that's the goal is to make you feel like a kid again. Um, we also give you a certain sense of agency. And again, in a game, we have agency all the time. We um, are asked to do things to advance the storyline. But in a film, there's these, uh, these tradition and structure that we're all used to, which is there's always an inciting incident. That's the catalyst for the story to advance. And we wanted to place that responsibility on the audience. So you actually create the inciting incident in the story. Um, which means that you basically get proof that the wolves may exist. And the knock on effect of that is that there are consequences to you sort of advancing the storyline and being responsible for that. We became obsessed with this idea that objects have secret lives, that they tell story. And um, for those of you who write and, and are storytellers, you know that exposition can be one of the most frustrating and boring things for the audience. Um, you have to explain what's going on in the story, usually through long-winded dialogue, and you're trying to wedge in all of this context, um, and you have to find creative ways to do that. And we thought, oh, now that we have our hands, we can actually empower objects to tell stories. Every object, no matter how mundane, has little surface scratches or little things attached to it that tell their secret lives, all the things that existed. So that's where we wanted to start to shove backstory. So we spent about six months exploring this idea and it's very successful. The problem is it's extremely distracting when you're trying to connect to a character emotionally and you're fascinated by an object and you compound that with the fact that something in virtual reality is so novel, something very similar, like picking up a camera, something that you're very familiar with in the real world. Um, but suddenly this is a magical device. Um, it can completely distract you from what the character is trying to, tell you or some important narrative hook. So after sort of going down that path of, of narrative objects and their secret lives, we, re, we sort of realigned our compass to be this, which is natural intuitive interactions. And the previous speaker was talking about how we create art and sort of empowering uh, ourselves to be more natural and intuitive in the way that we interact with art. And this is exactly what we discovered in terms of storytelling. So when you interact in Wolves in the Walls, it's not uh, overt like uh, in most video games where you're gated and you're trying to flip a switch or open a door. It's things that you do um, to connect to a character. So a character might reach out and hand you something without even making eye contact and you grab it without thinking about it. So that's what we're calling a natural intuitive interaction. Things that escort the character. We even consider an interaction maybe moving to the side so that you can see where the character has gone behind a door because that is an interactive moment where you're escorting the character, making sure that Lucy's okay. She might have gone into a little dark corner of a room. And again, uh, things that help or hinder the character. But again, it's this connection to character. So every interaction that we ended up implementing in our experience is directly connected to character. And I think this is probably the most important part. It's the things that we do without thinking, the turning on of a light switch, um, the looking at a picture after you've taken it, all of these things that we do subconsciously that make us emotionally connect deeper to the content. <clears throat> we also uh, sort of started thinking about cinematography inside of virtual reality and coined this idea of emotional point of view. So we see the world the way that Lucy feels the world. And you can see when she's telling a scary story and she turns off the lights, all of a sudden we've stretched the room, we've made it dark. Uh, it's got a sort of Hitchcockian feel to it because we can change the environment. Rather than changing the lens of the camera, we're actually manipulating the space. And that's a superpower of virtual reality because um, we can't control the camera. So we've lost some power, but we've gained other superpowers in a way. Uh, again, thinking of virtual reality as um, the audience being the camera, uh, we had to think about how perspective works. In traditional Western perspective, we have a horizon line, we have a vanishing point, things converge to those vanishing points. But there's also this notion of Eastern perspective, which is the audience being the center of all convergence. And so we actually modeled and built all of our sets in 
Eastern perspective. So things are tilted and converged so that they converge towards the audience, towards the camera. And in this way, you're sort of the center of the story. And we think of this in terms of orbits. Because VR is so complex and quite honestly expensive to author a story in, we want to maximize your experience. So we have these three orbits, uh, a narrative orbit where things are interactive. It's usually things within one or two steps where you can pick them up, you can open a drawer and explore. Then we have a contextual orbit that might have exposition and backstory built into that environment. And then we have a background orbit that sort of fills in the blanks, but doesn't really encourage you to go explore because we want to contain you in that space. We often ask ourselves throughout the project, and, and now I ask myself anytime I'm working in any medium, why am I doing this in this particular medium? And in this case, VR provided us a lot of superpowers, like I said, and it also provided us with ways to tell stories that we couldn't in other um, mediums. So yeah. we used the fact that you are Lucy's imaginary friend to be able to tell stories as if she were imagining them. So sometimes she would get down on the ground and she would actually draw with her magic crayon a little example of what was going on in her house. And then all of a sudden we're inside the drawing. And this builds and builds and builds to, uh, to sort of the climax where uh, we literally are in, inside a therapy drawing of her imagination with the scary wolves and the manifestation of that. And so we can really explore what it means to be part of someone's imagination within that medium. Um, we also wanted to sort of put you inside of a storybook. So we made everything look like watercolor. Uh, we went to great lengths uh, inside of a real-time environment to make it feel like you were inside the pages of a book. Sound is so important to any experience. Um, I think we've probably all experienced what it feels like to watch something epic without the sound on, but in again, in virtual reality, sound is, uh, is so powerful. And getting back to that idea of being an eight-year-old kid, we can actually listen to a wall with a jar. And because of spatialized audio, we can zone in on a perfect listening spot, connect ourselves while we're staring at the character three inches apart. So we're hearing a conversation, we're seeing uh, the character react to that, and we're doing something. And that allows us to sort of build on your proprioception and your physicality, but also the emotional connection. And once we plug all of those ports, you become emotionally present. It really connects you to a character. This is kind of where we're going now. Um, so that's where we've been. Uh, Wolves has now uh, been done for over a year. Um, and we spent the last year really thinking about what it meant for people to connect to this character. We also were very suspicious about what are people consuming in terms of characters now? Um, we see this trend towards serial content, whether that's on Netflix or HBO, these things that we watch now and maybe binge watch, but we're getting, rather than 20 minutes with a character or 88 minutes in a feature film with a character, we're getting 20 hours with a character. And we start to get to know them in deeper ways. And when they do things that are unexpected, we feel betrayed by them or when they die suddenly in ep at the end of uh, season one, we're shocked because we've invested all this time in that. Um, and so we've invested all of this time to now bring Lucy to life. Um, and rather than thinking of Lucy as a character, we're starting to think of Lucy as an actress. Uh, and the way that we're doing that is we're fusing traditional forms of storytelling with artificial intelligence, things like GPT-3, where she can improvise but we're also creating an ongoing life and a backstory. So for the past six months now, we have Lucy um, basically every day of her life um, existing in some way. She interacts with hundreds of people. Um, she has her own alternate reality, which uh, is a version of 1988 uh, where she lives and uses a BBS to connect online and has a very primitive digital camera um, that she can take pictures of. And the audience can connect through Instagram. Lucy's not on Instagram, but through this magical wormhole, we have a window to connect. Um, she has a memory of all of the people that she engages with. She can see them, she can talk to them. Um, so we're exploring what it means for a character to have this ongoing life. And 
the ultimate goal is to have 20 year relationship with a character. What does it mean to build a bond emotionally for that character to understand who you are, uh, what your hopes and dreams are, um, what the challenges that you face are, and the two of you forming a bond together to help each other sort of overcome obstacles, go on adventures together. Um, so Lucy's the first sort of experiment in that. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you have any questions, that's... Yeah, well, actually, <clears throat> pardon, I thought it was really uh, interesting what you said about designing for a long-term relationship with a character that evolves. Um, you know, I, I work in narrative design as well, and um, I agree that that's what audiences in the future are going to kind of want, a, a sustaining connection um, rather than, you know, the way we see the way we see people consume content today is serial. Um, they look for alternative routes to engage with characters uh, outside of the main medium in which they originally encountered it. Um, what would you say is, is an important consideration for you when designing for something with that kind of longevity or or how do you design that kind of long term sense of a longer term social relationship absolutely uh so i think one of the most important things uh, for any character but especially when there's interactivity involved is that um and and also when you're considering ai is that the character has to have a passion a goal um, and a purpose and an arc if they don't have that they are Alexa, they are Siri, which feels like you're meeting Siri or Alexa for the first time every time. There's mm -hmm. no sense of purpose. And so, especially when we're, we're working with Lucy, um, and I've worked with Lucy now for three or four years, um, I know Lucy's purposes, and I spend a lot of time making sure that whether or not you engage with her, she's very focused on the next step that she needs to get to. She'll care about you and she'll accommodate you and, and want to be your friend. But um, if you were to neglect her or mistreat her or um, or become too self-focused, she's not going to just accommodate that behavior. And I think that sort of anarchistic, like let's test every little corner of the system um, that another speaker was talking about earlier. Um, we avoid that because Lucy is just on to the next thing and you kind of want to find out what's what's what she's up to. Cool. Well, I have one more question before um, we transition into the next speaker. And that's, I liked what you said about the, um, the audience members providing the inciting incident. Um, I think that kind of dovetails with you saying that an AI character cannot simply be reactive to what the user is doing. They have to have sort of their, their own intention and the audience creates an incident for them to respond to rather than themselves being the factor that motivates or engages with that character. Um, I, I, I thought it was interesting. Um, how do you differentiate your notion of an inciting audience member from a game developer's notion of a of a player in a narrative game? I think this is something we're all coming to terms with as creators and storytellers and artists. Um, uh, it's uh, There's a theme emerging today, and maybe I'm just reading into it, but uh, we've been so focused on the micro control of the mediums that we work within. So if you think of an animator, an animator right now, their job is largely creating points on a curve and tweaking those points to, you know, to create life on the other side of the screen. Uh, a modeler is pulling points and vertices and that level of micro control is going to disappear with AI because AI is going to improvise those things. And so our role then as creators becomes more directorial in every regard we're sort of, this is the emotion I want to create. We're mm -hmm. going to direct our actresses. We're going to direct our actors and say, you create this and let the AI improvise. So in mm -hmm. that way, the inciting incident, we need to pay attention to the audience member, mm -hmm. figure out what the story that they want to tell is, and then create the container that they can tell that story in. So I'm pretty convinced that the future of story is the audience is the main character. The characters that we consider main characters now are the supporting characters they're mm -hmm. the impact characters they're the ones that are pushing the audience to mm -hmm. have these moments of revelation and experience and emotion mm -hmm. um, so it's really about creating those containing spaces and creating these stimulus and these triggers within um, these experiences so that people feel like oh i had consequence that choice mattered mm -hmm. it had this result this is emotionally impactful for me. Yeah. Um, I want to go and, 
and try more things. Yeah, what what the audience members uh, want from a narrative is 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 more of a reflection of the like parasocial relationship they're having with the fictional character, and not like the analysis of fiction beats that are going to lead to a satisfying outcome. Well, I, yeah, interesting. I I, I fully agree with uh, a lot of what you said. Thank you so much for um, your presentation. Absolutely. I I think we are ready to move on. Yeah. Um, we will be introducing artist Laturbo Avedon. Um, Laturbo exists and makes work entirely as an avatar in virtual space. Um, their new work is called Your Progress Will Be Saved, and um, it, it reimagines um, the festival's new factory space using Fortnite Creative um, as part of the Virtual Factory exhibit at virtual-factory.co.uk if you want to check that out. Um, and there's, there's ways to experience that even if you don't Fortnite. Um, so Latrobo Avedon's work emphasizes the practice of non-physical identity and authorship. Um, and over the past decade, their body of work has explored the ever-growing intensity between users and virtual experiences, that's in their words. And in particular, they focused on deepening the meaning of memories in cyberspace. Um, I think we have Latrobo's presentation in the form of a video that I'll turn it over to our crew to start. Thanks, Latrobo. Hello world. Wow, it is so nice to be here with all of you. Manchester International Festival. Lee, Danielle, Kareem, Paolo, Pete. It makes me so happy to see you round up with so many forward thinking minds together in the same place. I'm grateful to get this opportunity to join you all. My name is Litarbo Avdon. I am an avatar, futurist, curator, and gamer, from the internet. This year, I was invited to be the first artist to create a project for the Virtual Factory series. Before I get started, I'd like to give a little bit of a background for myself, and my work, to help frame my perspective of creating art in the metaverse. If we haven't met before, you can connect with me on Twitch. Twitter, and Instagram as well. I am an avatar. A virtual person that began, and will continue indefinitely, in these immaterial frontiers. For the past 10 years, I have created art solely through software and virtual resources. In this time, I have spent thousands of hours exploring the metaverse. Moving from platform to platform. Learning how to coexist with other users. And to participate in the worlds of video games, social media networks, and other networked environments. As often as I can, I encourage people to consider the word Metaverse and how they are a part of it and what exactly they want it to be. It is so much more realized than many people have considered. Many people think about virtual reality as what you find through a headset. A divide. It is so much closer than that. Today, virtual reality is braided with the physical. Almost every action bears some mark of the internet and its machinery. The very flow of information is sculpted by the metaverse. As our history, memories, facts and fiction flow through its endless passages. The notions of digital dualism fall away when we realize how interwoven these realities have always been. There is so much to value, and so much at stake, in your virtual self. This year, more than ever, so many people have come to accept, and appreciate, how much can be accomplished in our shared virtual reality. I must say though, I wish there were better circumstances, to see so many people finally embrace what can be done here in the metaverse. Since my earliest days, 
I have been seeking a view of the bigger picture. To connect the dots, not just for what can be experienced here, but to understand who I am, who we are, as avatars, as virtual people, creating themselves within cyberspace. In my different works I have sought to reflect some of this back to the public, to remind them that there is so much more to appreciate, in places often dismissed as games and diversions. I am not alone. The role of the Avatar has been present for centuries. Characters created immaterially, seeking to perform and render a greater purpose. From myth and allegory to multiplayer games and networks, there is a line that can be drawn between all of them. Sometimes, when we are so close to the tools of our moment, it can be difficult to give them the focus and appreciation that they deserve. On this note, I want to take you inside the virtual factory and reflect on some of the ways that this work came together on the cusp of a global pandemic. A lot of people don't realize how much creative latitude exists on the Fortnite creative platform. I feel this can be said about many video game worlds, as the loudest voices are often those of esports players and streamers that prioritize the competitive content. It was really encouraging to see the Manchester International Festival recognize what exists beyond these layers and allow me to bring the virtual factory into this world. I was supported by Team Create some of the most talented builders on the Fortnite platform to bring the details of this installation to life. My installation in the virtual factory is called Your Progress Will Be Saved. The title is a nod to safe rooms. Isolated, secure parts of otherwise dangerous game environments. Where a player can take a moment to pause and record where they had reached at that point in time. I wanted the virtual factory to serve this purpose. A point of reflection, adjacent to the rapidly expanding state of the metaverse today. From this sort of safe place, I wanted to reflect back the beauty and challenges that virtual worlds can offer us. As we connect now, in the fall of 2020, we have grown accustomed to the matrices of our friends and colleagues, stack informations, of video conferences. We've gotten used to life on our screens, working, partying, celebrating birthdays, weddings, all through the virtual services that we have available. My work in the virtual factory reflects back the structure and format of how so many of these things will continue, while we live in a world that is forced into isolation. I believe that our virtual tools have offered us a point of synthesis to finally bring together so many formerly isolated forms of creation. Through software, writing, performance, sculpture, and so many other forms of storytelling can be added together. This navigable poem would not have been possible on a canvas. I couldn't have articulated its details and defiance of impossibility if I had tried to create it solely in the physical world. For those of you that visited the virtual factory, you may have been challenged or possibly defeated by the difficulty of finding the exit. This, to me, was such an important part of the finished work. After a player has explored the installation and the nightclub that we built inside, they are told to find a way out or simply stay forever. 
video games, like life, can be so difficult, sometimes. But it is this struggle, to beat the game, that I think is so important to contemplate, and learn to value. For the Virtual Factory, we created a challenging way to beat the level. A regular system of jumping and climbing, where the player passes through the seasons, from spring, onward to winter. One of my favourite stories that I heard, from someone that had played through until the finish, was that they simply couldn't beat it, until they recruited their young son, to help them with the puzzle. Sometimes, you can't go it alone, and you might need to as a friend or loved one, to help you through it. As I take you through this area without a lot of the trouble of playing it, I'll share with you the complete poem, from which I made the installation. I remember a cabin, out in the wilderness. I knew I could find you, here, all watched over, on this endless night. I saw all the mirrors on earth, and none of them reflected me. In the mirror I saw everyone, gathered all at once. It was above, and so below. Reloading, this recurring dream. Find a way to climb out, or stay forever. I could see through it, like a keyhole. My timeline across windows and tabs. Seasons beginning to render again. Memory loaded from the server. My message carved into a forgotten tree, in the blue light of my screen. I can almost see it. In the distance, my reflection. Close your eyes. Janus, remember me. While I wait here for the dawn. The virtual worlds we have, in this time, are just the beginning of what vivid possibilities await us in the years to come. It is through a creative community of both players and creators, that we can learn to create virtual experiences for our hearts, minds, and history. Take your time, in the metaverse. Thank you. Manchester International Festival for allowing me to realise this work. It has been an amazing year, seeing that millions of players have come to visit and explore the virtual factory. I can't wait to hear from all of the panellists today, to hear how virtual worlds have enabled them to develop and explore their creativity, in their own unique ways of this time. My name is Letarbo Avedon, and I'll be here, online.
Thank you very much, Laturbo Avedon. Uh, we now have Danielle Brathwaite Shirley, who will speak to us about using games to archive lives and memories. Um, Danielle's practice uses a wide range of digital and interactive media to communicate the experience of being a Black trans person, and their work has been exhibited at the Tate, at the Barbican, and the Science Gallery, among other venues. Um, Danielle weaves lived experience together with fiction to tell trans stories in imaginative ways, centering those who have been silenced, not just in these media, but by particular intersections of violence in a deeply unjust reality. Um, Danielle's work asks demanding questions about the nature of institutional memory, and I'm looking forward to hear their presentation. Welcome, Danielle. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm just going to start on why I actually started to make archiving games. Um, and initially, it all started with these kind of character customization, um, creating your own avatar, creating their own a character that can see that you can see that represents you in a game, and so these are some examples of that. And um, when I saw these, uh, I finally had an aha moment of where I could actually see myself in a video game and see myself presented in some way. Um, but there was still a very big disconnect between seeing your avatar and actually playing a story that doesn't necessarily represent you. Um, and so, and it really came about when I was playing a lot of MMO RPGs, and this is an example of EverQuest. And I was trying to create my character in EverQuest, and you had to pick a black character, and they only had a black character with a certain type of forehead. This is EverQuest two, but in EverQuest one, there was only, the black character only had a certain type of forehead, which I found really disturbing and really like messed up because um, they had a limited amount of character customization depending on the race of the individual. Um, and something that I really loved about MMOs at the time were you had these communities that were built by the people in them um, that uh, kind of had this form of communication that you weren't really getting in the outside world and also this uh, ability to play a role, form of community without having to step outside. So you could make spaces that couldn't actually exist in the real world. Um, and so off that, thinking off that, I started to design these characters based on the people around my life who were all black and trans. And so this is one of the characters I designed. Um, they're called I Just Got My Hair Did. And we uh, um, gave them a character description and some powers. Um, and we thought, OK, how can we push this further? Like, this is just a character. It's not interactable. And so that's how let's move on from here. Oh, sorry. That's how we kind of got into the idea of um, an archive. Like, how can we use a game to archive us, archive who we are? And what do we want that archive to do? And we thought we want an archive that fights back, that can protect itself, decides what people can access on, depending on who they are, center Black trans people, and is accessible. Um, and because of that, we started thinking about how, what have archives done to fail us before? Why are we not in the archives now? Why do we feel like we have to create our own one and use the medium of a game to make one? And that's how, um, this is just an image, sorry. That's how I got onto resurrectionlands.com. Um, and this is a video game based around the, the wish of, um, digging up those black trans people in the past who were not archived and restoring them, restoring them to a place that they could exist. And if we could restore them and archive them digitally, would we be able to actually center them um, and have the data remain here or would it again be lost time? And so if we could play intro video, video number one called intro video, sorry. After we had discovered the technology to scan the earth and bring back your memories buried within its history, we decided to bring you back. We didn't know what to do with you at first. And I'm just going to talk about over this. So this was the premise of the game. So when you start the game, this is the first thing you see. And it kind of sets up the story that um, all these black trans people have been brought back and are being stored in this place called the Resurrection Lands. And this is a place that people are going to visit. And that visiting, the allowing people to visit, eventually corrupts this place. 
um, and cr um, makes it more of a kind of carnival or a um, exploration of black and transness rather than like respecting them as people and seeing them as individuals to respect. Um, and we did this because we kind of wanted to talk about why archives have failed, what have they done that have failed. And the reason the archives have failed black trans people is the art recording of us has been secondhand, has been from someone that isn't us. They haven't allowed us to say why we count um, the stories we want to tell, and they haven't allowed us to store those particular stories, only the stories that they think are important. Um, so yeah, and so that's the end of that video. Thank you. And so when you go into this archive, it asks you to pick a team. So you could pick a pro-black trans team or a consumer team. And depending on which one you pick, you can either go to an overworld that looks like this or an overworld that looks like this. And each overworld has a completely different um, feel and um, kind of information transfer. And so after this, after this was made, we decided to think about what does it actually a black trans archive look like? Something that does center black transness and that does retell our stories in the way that we want. And so we decided to make, we are here because of those that are not. And this was made with around 15 different black trans people. Um, and we all had the chance to create our characters. So everyone created a character um, and a storyline. And our, my job was to weave all those storylines and characters together in a cohesive universe that could be accessed online by anyone. Um, and I'm going to play that video at the end. But so um, the beginning screen is that you're met with um, this message that says, welcome to this pro-Black, pro-trans archive. It kind of tells you what the archive is about, um, but also informs the audience that depending on who they are, they may feel uncomfortable, that this space wasn't necessarily made for them and it was made specifically for black trans people. And so the first question you're asked as soon as you enter the archive is, what is your identity? And this has become a really important part in all of my work is that the person's identity determines on what kind of game or what kind of experience they will have. Um, and so a black trans person will have a completely different experience to a cis person. And that's important because we wanted an archive that actually responded to how people answer questions and responded to what they were looking for, what kind of gaze they were bringing onto us um, and how we also wanted to kind of play with that idea of that of being passive, of this archive being passive and allowing you to have complete access to it. And actually the saying this archive is not passive and you have to be extremely active within this archive um, to look at yourself, to look at the questions that you're asked and to look, at the, to look at the answers that you're given to then say, okay, like what, what does me being here mean? What does a black trans person being archived mean? Um, if this space isn't for me, why am I here? What am I learning or what am I not learning? Why was I kicked out? Um, and so these are just some examples of like the kind of places that you could visit. So you could have the non-passing fields. There was also um, an opportunity to resurrect some ancestors as well. Um, yeah, and so something that always comes up um, when we talk about technology is terms and conditions. And uh, we thought we would create a terms and conditions that would center black trans people and that people would have to agree to in order, you know, uh, people would have to agree to in order to um, access the game. So they would have to say, yes, I do accept these terms and conditions. I do center black trans people and I do decenter myself in order to be here so that they wouldn't just reap the rewards of being in our presence in terms of having the sound, in terms of seeing this world, but they would also have to say, I decenter myself in order to even be in this presence. Um, and the reason we really wanted to do that was because I was kind of tired of having games that would say E for everyone, pitched for everyone, anyone can access it, and it, and it um, represents everyone's stories regardless of who or how you're playing it. And I really don't believe that games are doing that because I haven't had that experience myself. 
they haven't really represented us um, in that way. And when they do, we often get this kind of politics that we don't want politics in our games. That when a, when a black character or a female character or a trans character is introduced, and just recently in The Last of Us 2, there was a massive uproar and a massive hate towards this person being introduced. Um, and so having seen that and um, having to want to play these games, but also know that the community around that um, doesn't really like or appreciate your presence, um, is something that we want to completely counteract within Black Trans Archive. Um, and so the most recent one um, I've made is, I can't remember a time I didn't need you. Um, and so this is a twine game um, that's online as well. They're all online. Um, but this, the different thing about this archive is that uh, it talks about the pandemic, um, the pandemic of anti-Blackness, um, as well as what it means to want to go to a protest, what it means to want to go there and who you're going there for. And the great thing about using Twine was that you could prompt questions and people would have to put the answer in. So an easy one is, what is your name? So they put their name in so we could personalize it more to the person playing. And this is less of an archive of, say, an experience, like there is some of that in there, but it's more of a kind of, how would I say, like a form. It's more of a form that the viewer is filling out and having to fill out honest answers about themselves. Um, and so in the game, as in all my games, you have to identify yourself at the beginning. Um, and depending on how you identify, you may get questions like this, like what privileges do you have? Um, and we require you to type in the answer to what privileges you have. And then after that, you have to type in another answer saying, Okay, so how are you going to use these? So what have you used these privileges for? And how might you use them to benefit someone else that isn't you? Um, and the great thing about asking these questions is that they're actually really hard. Like they're really hard to answer, to write down your privileges. Uh, it may not be hard in a way that makes you sad, but it's hard in a way to genuinely think, okay, I'm keep getting these prompts of questions. And the only way forward is for me to answer them. And my answers are being used in the next sentence of the game. Um, and so this is something that I'm moving more towards is having moments archived and the responses of the individual who's playing also part of the archive that they start being embedded in there. Um, and that's something that's currently missing that I really want to put in. Um, yeah. And so how do you acknowledge your privilege? How would you answer that? And that is the end of the presentation. But I just want to play that the second video before I end which is the splash screen for, um, uh, sorry, um, blacktransarchive.com, or oh, we are here because of those that are not. Yeah, and so I'm gonna again talk. Well, just a small thing about this is that all the music in the game is actually created by those that are involved in the process. So we make all the music, all the graphics, and so we build a black trans team around building an archive. And that's something that I think is like pivotal in order, if you're trying to do something that actually involves a group of people, such a specific group of people, allowing the foundations of the entire experience to be curated, built, and designed by those people actually means that you, you get that experience and also give them that experience. Um, and I, I, I think that's something that we miss a lot is that often a lot of these game development teams are white male and cis. And even if they're creating experiences that aren't theirs, um, that are trying to be inclusive, they can't do that because their teams do not reflect those that they are trying to represent. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, um, Danielle. I think that uh, thinking of, of human bodies in a data memory context is really moving. 
Um, I wanted, uh, we have we have a couple Q and A, we have some questions for you as well as some questions for Pete that we'll do at the end of this section. But while I've got you, I wanted to say, I just absolutely love your aesthetics um, on your website as well as in your presentation. And I wondered if you would be able to talk about um, the relationship between your aesthetic choices and the themes of your work, if any. Yeah, um, it's strange because the first game I ever remember playing is actually Blade on PS1. Oh my god. <laughs> I <laughs> <didn't>. um, <laughs> They all had like, these blocky heads um, and also like Spider-Man Spider Enter Electro on oh. PS1 as well. Um, and there's something so nice about having these like really rough graphics that essentially tell the whole story, you know? Yeah. Um, and something I is still in love with is the first Metal Gear and how the faces don't talk, they're the mouths don't open, but the head shake. And it's about that like kind of minimalism, like mm. the lack of polygons within the work and the quickness of that can allow you to really capture something very fast. Like very, very There's no chance of over empathizing on your own when the hands are square. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Like you can try and get down to actually what you're trying to say rather than maybe making the fingers. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I'm like I think I'm a massive fan of like Puppet Combo's work, the old, the kind of like new uh, PS1 horror scene. Oh, uh, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of that as well. Um, so I think also you said um, one of the problems with the archiving challenge um, for Black trans people is that it's mostly been secondhand, and it's important for people to start stepping up and telling their own uh, stories. In this case, um, sort of, how are you sort of approaching um, attracting collaborators for this project, and and what's sort of your what's your process like in terms of incorporating other individuals? Yeah, so our process is actually, we don't center on um, people with technique or skill. We center on people that um, have not had the opportunity. That's what our main goal is. It's actually bringing in a bunch of people that have never, ever even thought about archiving themselves or even something digital to do with mm. them. I was going to think, do you have a challenge even sort of explaining what it is you're doing as an artist and what yeah. you want them to do? <clears throat> How do you approach that? Yeah, so usually I say like, okay, I want to put you in a video game, but I want you to design it. That's usually what happens. So we usually sit in a room full of people that have never designed anything. And uh, over the course of three or four workshops, we design the game together. And then I have to go away and build it, which is usually a problem. <laughs> but, um, but the great thing is that a lot of these people, they have no idea how to design something, but by the end, they're, they're, they're speaking it as if they know code. They're speaking <laughs> as if they understand how to put themselves and implement themselves in a game. And so that's that's something that's really shown us in the project that you don't actually need someone with this background. Mm. You just need to give them the opportunity. And just as you do in boardrooms, you just throw ideas at the wall until mm. you realize this person has a better idea than I could have ever come up with. And yeah. it's because it's about themselves. Yeah. And in fact, I think sometimes people come up with um, new ideas when they're working with an unconventional vocabulary, when they don't have access to the traditional tools exactly. and they're trying to interpret it through the language that they know that has not been um, part of that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I need to transition on. We have some questions from folks on Twitch for you as well as for Pete. Um, let me look at some of these. Uh, Pete, are you available to answer a question? Absolutely. Um, someone said, I'm interested in the involvement of the originators of Lucy, Neil Gaiman and Dave McKeon. How does that work as things evolve in Fable Land? Uh, so they've been very encouraging um, throughout the project. Um, uh, had the chance to share Wolves with Neil, um, which was very special. And uh, the characters loosely based on his daughter. So I felt like this enormous <laughs> amount of um pressure obviously to to do that character justice and i think we're um you know we're always just conscious of involving them when we have new ideas and things like that um but uh, yeah it's been a great relationship and i feel very supported by them fab this question is for danielle hi danielle what was your favorite environment throughout your exploration of mmorps and uh, mmorpgs and why was there something about it that resonated with you at more than others um and how do you think we can reduce toxicity in online worlds so two big questions but <laughs> your, your most influential mmo whether or not it was the most okay. or least toxic um okay my most influential mmo is actually asheron's call 
which is an old MMO. Um, I I love everything about that game. Um, I love the kind of portals, the character create customization, the the terrible graphics, the fighting style. I had uh, not thought about that in a long time. Yeah, what I really love about that world is that it looks like the world was created small and then scaled up. Um, and I'm I'm just a big big fan of that. Um, yeah, I'm 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 also kind of uh, super into um, EverQuest. I really love that. Um, and also Ultima, Ultima, Ultima Online. Um, so those are kind of the, the ones that I really love the retro ones. I'm not so much into the new ones. I, I feel you. Yeah, I'm the same. And um, Pete, you have a fit. Oh, sorry. Uh, I didn't need to. Sorry, Danielle. The second question they had. Sorry. I can't remember the second question they had. Uh, do you have thoughts on reducing toxicity in online oh, yeah. worlds? Yeah, um, yeah, I think um, moderation is like a huge, huge problem we have now. Um, especially, I thought about this a lot when we had that Club Penguin server that got taken down because it was yeah. a mess. Um, and I think like you just need like people who are like on your side and have a specific message of like what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, just like when you have YouTubers that do moderation for the uh, YouTuber they love, they know exactly what they're looking for rather than um, a kind of like searching word game. Mm -hmm. um, and I think moderators can need to be given a bit more like maybe credit and visibility. Like we don't know what Facebook moderation is and looks like because they won't tell us um, or Instagrams. But I, I think if we need some transparency in that, because there's a lot of work that goes into that, but also yeah. a lot of weird behind the scene politics. Yes, and, and that's all done with a data bias in mind too, isn't it? You know, right. on, exactly. on one hand, you know, those fa Facebook moderators are human beings who are being exposed to like grueling content to where they have to get trauma counseling according to some exactly. of the, you know, reporting I've read. And yet they're just enacting the policies of a platform with a biased data system. Exactly, exactly. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think this is on topic. Let me go to Pete. <laughs> <laughs> Someone said it was really interesting what you said about Eastern perspectives. Why did you choose to explore the project in that way? It was uh, an idea um, from our production designer, um, Kendall Cronkite, who is the designer of the Madagascar series. She's absolutely brilliant. Um, oh. Always looking for interesting ways to represent characters and space. And uh, I think the revelation was that in a lot of Eastern painting, um, the convergence point is uh, you as an observer, even in a painting, those points converge to you observing it. And that felt so appropriate for virtual reality because mm. as you look in any direction, the world is converging towards you. Um, it also helps solve a lot of problems um, because you know, you're not physically walking through space. You're kind of taking a few steps in any direction. We still needed to make the mm -hmm. world feel rich and full. And so by adjusting all of the planes so that you can kind of observe them from a distance. Um, it just, it just clicked. Um, and then that combined with this concept of emotional point of view um, allowed us to, to sort of represent space in a really interesting way. But yeah, it was, it was absolutely inspired by sort of uh, medieval painting, but from, from the East, which we, at least in my art history, we, we covered you know, only about that much of it. So it was really cool to do a lot of research in that. Yeah, that is so, so interesting from, from the uh, perspective of, uh, of VR perspective, from the perspective of thinking about perspective. Um, we are gonna wrap up, but I have a one more question that I think maybe uh, each of you could answer in turn, um, starting with Danielle. Um, could you tell us a bit more about other things you're working on and has 2020 pr changed your practice in any way? Um, so currently I'm working on a on a rail shooter, um, which is like super exciting, but uh, really to, we're trying to make an online shooter where <laughs> you can't shoot black trans people, but it, it, it's super hard. It's super hard. I don't know. It's so yeah. hard. It's so hard to figure out how we're doing this. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's what we're kind of making. Um, and 2020 has changed everything. It's changed everything. Like I have to... Um, you know, we're working, all my coders are away, they're far away now. So everyone we're working with is so remote, which is interesting because you get like, now you can work with anyone, but at the same time, if your internet is rubbish or, um, you, or you just have like a bad day, um, you doing this 24 hours a day is just so much harder. Oh. You can't go to the pub and meet your friends mm. for a conversation. You have to do it again on another a digital device. So I feel like, um, that separation away from digital, I just feel like I'm getting lost in all this online world. Um, <laughs> make it better or worse? I have no idea, but we will see. <laughs> <laughs> 
And, and Pete, what about for you? you? How's your 2020 looking and, um, and how has this year affected your practice? It's been remarkable. I think um, if anything, it's accelerated our work. Um, it's obviously been challenging, but uh, I think we were at the beginning of the year, we were very convinced that it would be a long time before people understood what we were even attempting to do. Lucy, you know, is associated with this virtual reality project. Um, and we're, we've been exploring with her for many years, but we're, we're now convinced that, you know, we're going to be creating many characters, um, and those characters will have ongoing lives. And I, I felt like it was going to take a while for the audience to be ready for that. Um, but this massive shift mm. in how we interact mm. with content has basically made it that that audience is already here. And so we are scrambling to try and accommodate that audience, um, which is very exciting, but it's, you know, we are completely like tap dancing and improvising as fast as we can go to try and figure out how to do this. Yeah, you know, it's not to make light of what's been a, a difficult year for so many people and what will likely, you know, get more challenging, the consequences of the pandemic. Um, some things that have emerged that we can feel positive about is this shift in our work and 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 this this sense of a new relational paradigm in virtual space now that more people are ready for it um you know hopefully hopefully we will in some ways be able to overcome some of the constraints in in virtual space and in the technology industry um uh, with this new influx of ideas and um i think that's the end of our time today i want to thank all of our speakers so much um it's been a real pleasure for me to to host this discussion and thanks to everyone who joined in on Twitch. Um, I don't know if there's closing remarks on the festival's end or if I just wave bye. <laughs> All right, I guess we just wave bye. Thank you, everyone.